we're going to look at uh, a couple of things. I want to look at Ruth uh, and how God saw, sees Ruth. And then I want to look at Jesus. Jesus, our Redeemer. The one who is worthy and the only one who is worthy. The only one that is capable to redeem us. I look at uh, Ruth and uh, as she made that decision uh, from having to move from uh, Moab and go, into, go with uh, uh, Naomi to, to Israel. She made the decision that she wasn't going to stay there and go on. Now, we don't know much about the previous story of, of Ruth. Uh, the Midrash tells us that she was the daughter of Eglon, the king of Moab. Now, whether that's true or not, I don't know. But certainly that's Jewish tradition, that she was uh, a, a daughter of, of King Eglon. That, does, that means that she is actually someone of importance. Now, again, the Bible doesn't say that, and we'll leave that alone. That's a, that's a possibility. But we do know that she was willing to give up her, her identity, her culture, her language, her family, and say, no, no, I want to go, and I want to go with you, Naomi, and I'm going to go to Israel. And she says in uh, chapter 1, verse uh, 16, she makes this declaration, famous declaration. She says, I, I will lodge you, and your people shall be my people, and your God shall be my God. That is a massive statement. Now, in our modern society, we just, it's, it's not a great deal to pack up and, and move somewhere, right? But within our country, it's no great deal to move from New South Wales to Queensland. And as Queenslanders, we, we generally don't mind that, except at state of origin time. And, uh, you know, they're our brothers and sisters and we love them, except, you know, the worst thing about being thrashed in the origin is when a New South Wales person reminds you of it afterwards, right? You know, it's bad enough watching it, but then having to hear about it afterwards, it's like, you know, but we love them. They're better than Victorians. Have I offended everyone here yet? <laughs> no, I'm kidding. I think Jesus loves Victorians. But, uh... but in our modern times, right, we can move and no big deal. But she says, hey, I will make your people will be my people. Your God will be my God. And so she moves. But it's interesting to see how Ruth describes herself and the transition from the progress of how she views herself through the whole transaction. In, in the first chapter, she describes herself as a foreigner. Oh, I'm a foreigner. She, the actual term is Nicarea. So it's a Nicarea. Man, she's just a Nicarea. Like a foreigner. Like, but worse, she was Moabite. And of course, as Pastor Joshua has, has expounded, uh, you just weren't allowed to marry Moabites. Now, to justify it, many centuries later, the sages said, oh, yeah, that only applied to the men to try and justify why Ruth was, came into the house of God. But it doesn't say that in the Bible. It says, you're just not allowed to marry Moabites. And so she came over as a Moabite into the house of Israel and said, hey, I want to do that. In chapter 2, she describes herself when talking to uh, um, Boaz. She goes, Oh, no, I'm a shifra. Now, a shifra is like, I'm just a servant. I'm your servant. I'm a shifra. So she went from being a foreigner, Moabite, yes, up to being a shifra, which is, a, you know, a servant, a woman's servant. And then in, in chapter 3, after a bit more conversation, a bit more interaction with Boaz, she calls herself an amma. No, I'm now, oh, man, I'm just an amma. I'm a, I'm a maid servant. I'm a handmaiden. So she goes from, man, I'm a foreigner, I'm a Moabite. No, then I'm a female servant, a shifcha. And then she goes, no, I'm an amma, I'm a handmaiden. But she still sees herself as down here. She still doesn't see herself as part of the house of Israel. I'm just an amma. But then we look at the end of the story. And Boaz looks at Ruth, and Boaz has a different description of her. He doesn't call her foreigner. He doesn't call her a servant 
or a maidservant, he says, hey, you are my wife. And he says, you are my Isha, my wife. Because Boaz had a different way of looking at her. Yes, she might have thought she wasn't quite as good, but Boaz thought, hang on a minute, yeah, you might think you're here, but really you're here. You're my bride. I love the image of that because we look at Boaz as a, as a type of Jesus. And looking at uh, Ruth as a style and a type of the Gentiles coming in and forming, as we know later on, a church. And he looks at her and Jesus looks at her and says, yeah, I know you're not perfect. Yeah, I get that. But hey, you're not my servant. You're my Isha. You're my bride. And he looks at it and says, hey, looks at the church today. And he says, hey, yeah, I get it. You're not perfect. That's okay. Yeah, I get it. You're still working through different levels of, of that. And you see yourself not quite as it. But Jesus looks at his church. That I'm talking about the church uh, universal. And he says, hey, that's my bride. But how does that come about? And let's have a look at that. So we're looking at Boaz. Now, Boaz uh, uh, was a, a relative of, of Elimelech. Now, it goes in the order of redemption. You had to be, it was brother, uncle, cousin. So if there was a brother, they had the first option in it. If that wasn't that, then it was the uncle. And if it wasn't an uncle, it was a cousin. So when Ruth uh, you know, asked Boaz, and he says, hey, you know, will you redeem not only my, the, my mother-in-law's property, but will you redeem me? He was redeeming the land. He said, yeah, 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 I've got to go and see this other person first. And uh, as Tracy mentioned, that uh, there was re redeeming of the land was, was a process because Jews weren't allowed to sell their land. So when it says... Are they going to redeem the land? It was meaning pay out the lease on it. Because what they would do is if they didn't require the land, you could lease it out to someone else. And they would, they would lease the land from you. Until the year of Jubilee, where everything was reset. And so what they'd have to do is, however many years left between when they wanted to redeem it and the year of Jubilee, they had to pay out that amount of money to be able to buy back the land. And so that was one of the things that he said, okay, yep, let's do that. And then he came to the second part, which is the, the Leverite uh, marriage laws. And uh, it was going to, they had to, if, if there was a brother, right? So uh, a man died, his brother would actually be able to, to marry them, and if not, carry on, so that he can actually produce an heir if there was no heir. Now, if you didn't do that, it was an incredible insult. I mean, it was, it was just, you were lower than, I don't know what, chewing gum on the bottom of the shoe. I don't know what's really bad in our society, right? I mean, you were scum. I mean, you were, that was just the lowest. If you didn't go and redeem or produce, uh, do your correct uh, rights, particularly with the marriage rights. In fact, it actually lists out in, uh, in, uh, in the Torah, it lists out what the woman could do. So if you didn't actually go and uh, marry her to produce an heir, in the front of all the witnesses, she could take off your shoe. Bah! Because that was an insult. Because to confirm a contract, the person who entered it took off their own shoe and said, yes, I confirm this contract. If you didn't take it off, she would take it off and say, you didn't do it. And to top it all off, in the face. Tracy's here showing me exactly what it was like. Right? Yeah. Sorry, did too much spit come out? Then? Yeah, sorry about that. <laughs> Bit of soap, but it'll be all good. All right. And uh, it was an insult. Yeah, which she would spit in your face in front of everybody. I mean, it was just not the done thing. Right? You had to do the right thing by your family members to be able to do that. Now, I don't know about you. I think there's other ways of being able to express your uh, discontent apart from spitting in someone's face, but it certainly gets the point across, right? Uh, everyone remembers it. Uh, just like, hey, you're a bad person probably suffices, but anyway, a good old spit. In the story of Ruth, 
talking about being redeemed still. It, I read the story and I think, hey, the author, uh, we're not sure who the author is. Jewish tradition says it was Samuel who wrote it. But again, it could have been anyone from Samuel through to, to Ezra when he finalized the canon, the, the Old Testament, right? Could have been anyone, but Jewish tradition says it was Samuel. And, uh, but the author names every important person in the story except the person who had the right to redeem him. In fact, I'm gonna, we're going to practice a little bit of Hebrew. Is that okay? Say, yeah, <laughs> that's a Jewish practice, not uh, Hebrew itself. <laughs> but don't go around spitting in someone's face, okay? That's just not a, not a good idea. Say, peloni almoni. Peloni almoni. Again, peloni almoni. It sounds Italian, doesn't it? Yeah, peloni almoni, a pizza, you know? Uh, <laughs> Now I'm offending Italians. I'm good, doing good today, aren't I? New South Wales, Victorians, Italians. Anyone else I haven't offended yet? Uh, no, but on a serious note, I'm not trying to offend. It's a joke. Uh, <laughs> Pelone Almoni means so-and-so. Yeah, so-and-so. Such and such. He wasn't even deemed worthy enough because he didn't fulfill his rights that his name was even recorded. They say so-and-so. Pelone Almoni. Eh, Pelone Almoni. If that was in Australia, we'd call him Joe Bloggs, right? <laughs> we would. Uh, yeah, I don't know, Joe Bloggs, he didn't do the right thing. Who is he? You know, what's, what's his story? <laughs> I, 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 I'll give you an insight to my imagination. I, I try to keep it quiet because it's a little bit unusual sometimes. <laughs> I look at the story and I think, this would be a great story if this was set in Australia. With, with Aussie lingo, right? You've got to get the ochre accent, the ochre everything. And I'm thinking, you know, Boaz, and of course we wouldn't call him Boaz, we'd call him Bo or Bowie. You know? <laughs> My mate Bowie. Bozo. Uh, Bozo, Bozo, that's even better. I like this one. Yeah. yeah. You know, I mean, hey, the Bozo. Yeah. 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 With the Aussie accent, right? And he goes, ah, you know, here this, uh, this Sheila, you know. I want to... Want to get a want to want to get a land back, eh? And uh, you know she's a good old bird, and uh, uh, I'm, I'm I'm thinking about making them a missus. <laughs> I, yeah, anything? Yeah, yeah. Hey, right, oh, no, fellas, we're taking up a collection. Dig deep, you know. Let's get a land back. Let's do the right thing. Don't be stingy. <laughs> I, I just think it would be an awesome Aussie story, wouldn't it? Someone should do that in the Aussie version of Ruth. <laughs> With Bozo. I like that. I, 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 I'm going to steal that. <laughs> Good. But anyway, Poloni Almoni, you know, so and so. Man, just didn't do the right thing. Now, of course, in, in, uh, when looking at the typology of the story, you know, Mr. Uh, Poloni Almoni, it's talking about representing the law. Because, of course, this is a story, as Pastor Joshua has pointed out. We're talking about Boaz, the Redeemer, and Ruth representing the Gentiles coming in in the church, and, of course, Naomi representing the Israelites. And uh, Mr. Such and Such representing the law. But in modern days, let's modernize it a little bit. There are other things that people try to use to be able to be redeemed to God. Some of them are very noble. Some of them say, hey, hey, look. Man, I'm going to offend everyone today. <laughs> Some people just attend church. Hey, I attend church. That's got to be good. Yeah, well, it is. Noble, brilliant, welcome, by the way. Uh, but going to church doesn't actually get you redeemed and being brought into a right relationship with God. Right. Keep doing it. It's excellent, but it's not enough to get redeemed. There's an, I look at other people. I was watching on TV. There was a celebrity on TV. I don't even remember who it was. And she's going, oh, I'm spiritual. 
I'm, I'm not sure what I am, but I'm spiritual. And I thought, you poor girl. <laughs> Good that she understands there's a spiritual element that was just not a physical life, right? I was pleased with her, but I thought, you poor girl. Open, open to something, but has no idea what she's open to. Now, that's not her fault. It's only her fault if she's been presented the gospel and explained, hey, why she has that feeling of being spiritual. The perfect reason for having that spiritual is to come to a right relationship with God. Other people look in different religions. Some of them are noble. Some of them have very good works, good ethics. Some people look in philosophies. And there's some very noble philosophies in the world, and past and present. It's wonderful. Some of them have good ideas. Some of them have good ways of, listening, of living life. No problems with that. But again, philosophies by themselves and religion by itself without a redeemer is just words. Now, Paul was a little bit more blunt than I am. Paul said it's like tickling the ears, right? Literally what, it, what he said, philosophy is tickling the ears because it makes sound good, but it does nothing. Now, I'm not talking about anyone who says good principles and good practices and good lives. We should do that. The Bible teaches that. But that's not the way to get reconciled to God. So how do we get reconciled to God? Wow. As Tracy quite rightly pointed out this morning, and Pastor Joshua, Jesus is our Redeemer. We get redeemed through Jesus Christ. There's a a scripture in Isaiah, I think we've got it up here, Isaiah chapter 44. And of course, this is a, a declaration and a prophecy. Isaiah 44, 6 says this, Thus says the Lord, the King of Israel, and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts. He says, I am the first and I am the last. Besides me, there is no God. Says the Lord and his Redeemer. See, Isaiah prophesied about that. He knew what was going to happen. There was coming a redeemer that could redeem both Israel and the Gentiles in the form of the church, bring them together, forming one body of Christ. The former and the latter joining together. I look at it and I think uh, because the book of Ruth is uh, uh, the only book in its entirety, and that's because it's short, which is good, that's read at the Feast of uh, Shavuot, where Uh, which is Pentecost, right? The Feast of Weeks. There's other passages that are read uh, out of Psalms and poems that are read, read, but it's the only book that's read in its entirety. Because it's talking about, the Shavuot is talking about the wheat harvest, barley harvest in the beginning, the wheat harvest in in the end. And it's talking about those who will return unto the Lord, coming together, as one people, the Israelites, the Jews, and the Gentiles, forming one nation in God. But there's a a couple of things, very symbolic acts that happen in the first fruits, which is part of the ceremony. They have two loaves. The only time they have two loaves together. And they call it a wave offering, a a loaf wave offering. And so the priest waves these loaves around, symbolizing the two parts. It's interesting to note, that it actually is leavened, not unleavened, meaning there's still sin. It's not perfect. We get that. Waving it around, it's the only day where there's actually two uh, sin offerings, one in the morning, as per normal, and then one in the afternoon. Two sin offerings. The traditional one in the morning for the Jews, for their, for their uh, uh, sins, and then a special one in the afternoon. Again, for me, I'm going to go out and say, that's for the church. Two sin offerings on the same day. Two loave offerings, still with leaven. But when we read the book of, book of Ruth. But I look at Boaz and, uh, 
uh, as our goel. Right? A nice word, by the way. I'm very impressed. Our goel. Everyone say goel. goel. Yeah, not go. If you've been to Latin America, you know what I mean. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go. First time I heard that, I was in South America, I don't know, it was 19, something like that. And someone had a game of football on, and someone went, go. I won't ruin my voice. And go, 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 go. This went for about 20 seconds, and I'm thinking, and I'm thinking, I'm looking at the TV thinking, the World Cup's not on, what's going on? And I'm saying, is this a special game? They go, no, it's just a club game. And I'm thinking, my goodness. Go. If you haven't seen it, look at it on YouTube. It's bizarre. Anyway, we're not talking about goals. Uh, we're talking about Goel, right? A, a Kingsman Redeemer. Now, even though the Kingsman Redeemer was very uh, common the practice, Boaz is the only Goel mentioned by name in the Old Testament. Any other reference, specific reference to a Goel, a Kingsman Redeemer, is talking about God. So all the other references, except for Boaz. Now, the name Boaz is a combination of two Hebrew words, but they come together and it mean, means he comes in strength, just like our Redeemer, Jesus Christ, comes in strength. Describing Boaz in the book of Ruth, in chapter 2, he goes, he's the Lord of the harvest. Talking about Jesus, let me apply these to Jesus. He's mighty in power. He's a man of authority, he's a rich in grace, he's large in provision, and he's capable and qualified to redeem. Let me say that again, this is talking about Jesus. This is talking about the Lord of the harvest, mighty in power, man of authority, rich in grace, large in provision, and capable and qualified to redeem. Now, I don't know about you, that sort of gets me excited. My voice is a bit funny this morning, but otherwise I'd be more excited. Man, he, this is Boaz, man, comes in strength. This is my Jesus. I love looking at the New Testament verses because Paul was a great fan of this concept of the Redeemer. And in Galatians chapter 4, verse 5, Galatians 4 and 5. says this. <laughs> it's all good. I've got it here. <laughs> but when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were born under the law that we might receive the adoption of as sons. Talking specifically here to the Jews. But later in Colossians, he expounds it, and even going on in Ephesians and Romans and Hebrews. In Colossians 1.14, he says, in whom, talking about Jesus, in Jesus, we have redemption. Through his blood, the forgiveness of of sins. See, what the law couldn't do, Jesus did. But Jesus was born under the law to redeem those who were under the law. That in itself is a mind-blowing concept, right? But not only that, in the same time as redeeming those who were under the law, he redeemed those who would become the church. And Gentile was brought in to the house of God. Under the law to redeem those under the law. So that those who were far off could come into the house of God. Now, does the church replace Israel? No, not in any way, shape, or form. Because God has called his people and added Gentiles to form one church. In fact, Paul gives an example of a vine, which is a, one of the great symbols of Judaism. And he says, no, no, what we've done is grafted on, not replaced. 
cut off the branches that weren't producing and grafted on. Grafted into the vine. The church has been grafted into the promises of God. Not replacing Israel, but joining with Israel into the promises. I love it. I look at... uh, uh, We'll come back to that. I look at the people that uh, are mentioned and looking at the significance of their names in the book of Ruth. Right? We've got Elimelech. Eli is my God. Melech, king. My God is king. Elimelech. So we've got someone who actually his name is, hey, my God is king. So we look at people who are even righteous or doing the right thing. They even say, hang a minute. People can even say, hey, come to church. (laughs) We look at uh, Ruth. Now, whether she was a a daughter of Eglon, I don't know. But I do know that she was was originally a foreigner, but brought into the house of God. I look at Naomi, whose name originally meant pleasant, still means pleasant. But through hard life, hard times, she said, no, hey, don't call me pleasant. Call me Mara. Call me bitter. And I'm looking at her life and I'm thinking, man, did she have a really hard life or did she just go through a hard time? Because I'm looking at it and I'm thinking, man, I can relate to that. Not a hard life. I've had a blessed life. But I've also had times in my life where it's just hard. And it's like, I go through one stage, you know when you, things are going well in life? You have things that are bad, but because your life's going so good, it's just like, oh yeah, it didn't really affect me. And then suddenly you go through some tough times, hard times, and suddenly it's, you get through this one battle and there's another battle, right? You get through that battle and what happens? There's another one, right? And another one, and another one. And uh, we can go through those tough times. The reality is good things happen in those tough times, but because our mind is so focused on the problems and the challenges, we just don't see it. Because it's just battle after battle after battle. And I can understand. There's been times in my life where I said, just like Naomi, hey, it's bitter. Life's just not going a bed of roses, you know what I mean? There's, There's just things that are happening. That's just not how it should be. Not because of sin, not because of anything, still praying, still loving God, but just challenges that come. I mean, the other other people that are mentioned, you know, uh, the mothers of Israel, because they wanted to, the author wanted to compare Ruth to the mothers of Israel. So you got Rachel and Leah, you know, Rachel, who was, uh, name means a sheep, but uh, she was described as beautiful. I don't know, it seems to be a theme in the whole book of Ruth, doesn't it? Beautiful. But Leah was described as, having beautiful eyes, meaning not so nice. (laughs) But as you're looking at these, you're looking at the names, man, you look at Perez, who is, you know, the the son of uh, an incestuous relationship between Lot and uh, his daughter. You look at Chilion and Orpha, man, and the names and and the, the waste literally means waste, terrible times. But you look at all these people and you think, hang on a minute, God redeemed all of those. Sometimes in our life we can go, hey, God is good and we're, uh, God, my God is my God, Elimelech, yeah, God is my God. Sometimes in our life it's like, God, oh, life is bitter. But God restores all people And even us, as we go through those individual stages, I look at Jesus and the life of Jesus. Look who Jesus interacted with. Man, he interacted with tax collectors, right? I mean, a tax collector. That's like the junk on on top of the junk on top of your shoe, right? I mean, that's, that's just go the lower of the low. Jesus interacted with fishermen. They weren't really known for their intelligence. No, have I insulted a fisherman now? Uh, they weren't really known for that. He interacted with Nicodemus, a leader and a great teacher in the Sanhedrin, the, the leadership of Israel. He interacted with lepers. He interacted with the blind. He interacted with demon-possessed people. He interacted with the woman at the well. 
In fact, I look at two of the great revelations that Jesus gave about, uh, uh, about spirituality, if I can say that, or indeed better, being redeemed. He's talking to Nicodemus and saying, hey, you need to be born again. One of the great teachers of Israel. And then to the woman at the well who had five, wives, uh, five husbands. And he goes a great revelation to her saying, hey, soon it won't be worrying about a temple because we'll worship God in spirit and in truth. Two great revelations, one to a great teacher in the house, in the, in, in, in the nation of Israel, and one considered lowest of low. But Jesus interacted with them all because Jesus came to redeem them all. Jesus came to redeem them all. Now, I'm not sure which one of you identify with, whether you identify yourself uh, previously or even now. Where was your past? Where was your past? I look at my past and think, my God, I'm glad he saved me. And I look at things and I think, oh, no, man, what did I do before I met Jesus? And I think, man, that's just dumb. Huh? Just dumb. But so how do we come to meet the Jesus? How, come do we, how can we come to meet our Redeemer? How can we come to meet him? One of the great themes in uh, Ruth is the concept of shuv, which is return. In fact, in chapter 1 of uh, Ruth, it's mentioned uh, 11 times. Shuv, return, return, return. Shuv is fate, makes up part of the word of teshuvah. Actually, teshuvah is uh, the, the singular form. means repentance. It's a returning to God. A teshuvah. A return, a shuv, return, to shuva, return to God. And that is only possible because of the great Redeemer, Jesus Christ. Our great Redeemer who died on a cross, but that's not why we're redeemed. We're redeemed because of His sacrifice, but because our Redeemer rose from the dead. We, we serve and we are redeemed, being brought back to God by our Redeemer who lives. There's a great song, my Redeemer lives, my Redeemer lives. Man, I worship God, my Redeemer lives. And that's our Redeemer, Jesus Christ. The one who redeemed me, the one who redeemed you, the one who can redeem our city, the one who can redeem our nation. Jesus Christ, the great Redeemer.